Hello, a very good morning. So we are going to continue with the chapter four for semester one, where we are going to look at the structure question for uh, solid liquid gas, which is the state of matter. Okay. So with annexation, let's begin our lessons. Okay. So uh, let's have a look at the questions for the structure question section B. So uh, question number one sounds like this. A real gas Z behaves almost like an ideal gas. For n mole of gas Z at pressure P, the graph of volume versus temperature is shown below. So this is the graph of volume against temperature. So number one, what is the most probable identity for gas Z? Uh, explain your answer. So there are actually two types of gases that you should know that uh, which are almost behave like an ideal gas under room temperature pressure. So uh, the two gases in here are either hydrogen or helium. So you write either one will give you the one marks in here. Okay, so why are they? Uh, why are they? Why can they behave almost like an ideal gas under room temperature pressure? If you notice carefully, between hydrogen and helium, they are actually the, among the two earliest elements in the periodic tables. Therefore, they are actually the lightest gas. So when you have the lightest gas, uh, there is uh, almost no intermolecular forces in between the particles. So therefore, they can behave almost like an ideal gas under uh, room temperature pressure. Okay, so that is the reason why. Okay, then we have a look at the question number two. So in question number two, you are required to mark. Uh, you are required to mark. Let me show you what the next slide. Okay, on the graph above, sketch and label the graph of variation in the volume at the lower pressure P naught and label. So, so in here, this, this is a graph of volume against temperature. So when you have a lower pressure, where should be the line that represents the lower temperature, lower pressure P? So this will apply specs to the Boyle's law, where Boyle's law stated that uh, get a volume of the gas is inversely proportional with the pressure. So in other words, if you have a lower pressure, you're expected to have a greater volume. So that is why the graph that represents at the lower pressure P is this line. Okay, you should expect it to have a higher volume. Okay, so that is for number two. And then number three, uh, this is how it sounds like. At the pressure P and temperature zero degrees Celsius, gas Y show a negative deviation. Marks the expected volume for gas Y in the above graph and explain your answer. So now this is another type of gas ready. So um, this is not gas Z anymore, this is gas Y. So what is, uh, and the question also stated that it has a negative deviations at zero degrees Celsius. So what is the expected volume? So when you have a a gas that divides from the ideal behavior at zero degrees Celsius, it will have a lower volume than the expected line. So since the black line in here is the ideal gas line, so for the volume at zero degrees Celsius, it should be lower. So this is your mark where at zero degrees Celsius, any point below the lines is considered correct as long as you have a vo lower volume. And then that's it. So you're also required to explain why is it like that. So under negative deviation, your PV is lesser than RT. So or in other words, PV over RT is great is smaller than one. Okay. So that uh, because under the same pressure, the volume is small and therefore they, uh, we, cannot ignore, uh, we cannot ignore anymore. And, and since there is this intermolecular forces that exist, so the intermolecular forces that exist in here is uh, attraction forces, okay, as described inside a negative deviation. So this is the reason why uh, the volume is lesser than expected in here, okay. So with that, that is how we are going to explain for chapter one, uh, question one. Then we are going to go for question number two. Element X is a monoatomic gas under room temperature pressure. Given the density of gas X at room temperature pressure is 0 0.163 gram per centimeter cube, calculate the molecular mass of X in here. So you have to use the ideal derived ideal gas equation, which relates between the molar mass and the density. So the molar mass of the density, either you write PV equals to nRT or straight away you write MR equals to dRT over P. Now do take notes that if you use PV equals to nRT and the uh, gas constant given in here is 8.31 Jomo minus 1 Kelvin minus 1. So your, uh, your pressure must be in the Pascal and the volume must be 
volume must be in meter cube. So the question in here is given in 0 0.163 gram per decimeter cube. So for decimeter cube, if you want to convert to become meter cube, you have to time 10 power of negative 3. But don't forget because density is mass over molar mass. So that is why the time 10 power of negative 3 is brought downwards in here. So it becomes 0 0.163 times 8.31 times 298 divided by 101 times 10 power of 3 kilopascal times uh, 1.0 times 10 power of 3. This 1.0 times 10 power of 3 is a result of changing from decimeter cube to meter cube. Okay, so that is why you brought downwards in here. Okay, so press your calculator. At the end of the day, you'll get your molar mass is approximately equals to 4.00. So in three significant figure, as shown inside the question, the question also has three significant figure. So your final answer should also be three significant figure. Number two, from the molecular mass calculated in A1, did use gas X and state the ideal behavior of gas M under room temperature pressure? If you check the periodic table, gas M is helium, actually. And uh, what is the behavior under room temperature pressure? It can behave almost like an ideal gas under room temperature pressure. Okay, so that is how you are going to answer for question 2A1 and 2A2. And then we have 2A3. In the graph of PV over RT against P below, sketch and label the line of the ideal gas and also gas M. So for ideal gases, it's supposed to be a linear line like this as shown in the graph in here. However, for gas M, so uh, it, it is only ideal under room temperature pressure. However, as the uh, there's a pressure increasing, so the, it divides more from the ideal behavior. So this is where the line M located, okay? So uh, it divides uh, positively under, uh, for helium gas, not only for helium, hydrogen also behave in the same way. So that is how you are going to answer for question number two, okay? Okay, with analysis, let's go to number three. Table below listed the temperature pressure of the critical point and triple point of the iodine. Based on the information, sketch the phase diagram for iodine. So, uh, of course, uh, the first of all is you must have the uh, this graph of the pressure against temperature. Axis is one mark. Then second mark goes to the curve. So the curve for um, iodine, it should be a positive uh, gradient in here. Okay, then you have a curve looking like this. So this is the second mark. The third mark definitely goes to label. So not only that you have to label the critical point and also the this uh, triple point, but you also have to label solid, liquid, and gas for the iodine here. So only then you get the full three marks for these questions. Okay, so try your best to describe as fully as you can, uh, regardless of where are the marks located, and you are because you are given a series of information, so you should be able to do that. Okay, so uh, as for the gradient in the melting curve in here, only water give a negative gradient, but uh, iodine is uh, not is not water, so that is why all of them are positively divided from the ideal behavior. Okay, so this is how you're going to answer for three A. So for three B, based on the phase diagram sketch, deduce the physical states of iodine under room temperature pressure. If you look at the phase diagram, one atmosphere is here. So 25 degrees Celsius is more or less here, okay? So uh, what you get expected in here is uh, iodine is a solid under room temperature pressure. Number two, state the changes occur when iodine is heated under room temperature pressure to 140 degrees Celsius. So back to this one. Uh, if let's say your, your iodine point is at here at a one uh, atmosphere, 25 degrees Celsius. So uh, it is expected that um, when you heat it to 140 degrees Celsius, it will be like this. So uh, 140 is greater than 113. So you expected that this gas X is located uh, at the gaseous space. So you can deduce that uh, this uh, under room temperature pressure. Okay, so gas, uh, this uh, substance iodine is a gas in here. Okay. Okay, so that is how you are going to uh, deduce for these questions. Huh? Okay, number three, suggest why iodine will undergo the changes occur in two when heated to 140 degrees Celsius. So this is due to iodine. Now they are trying to describe why is it iodine easily vaporizer. Huh? So when substance easily vaporized, you have to deduce from the angle of this, um, you have to deduce from the angle of uh, 
this is the intermolecular forces of the particles here. So all uh, iodine is a simple covalent molecule hold by weak van der Waals forces. So when it is a simple covalent molecule hold by weak van der Waals forces, so that is why the intermolecular forces is relatively weak. So that is why it can subline easily under, uh, under atmospheric pressure. So you have to explain iodine is a simple covalent molecule hold by weak van der Waals forces. Triple bond in the iodine is above atmospheric pressure. So that is why it will subline under uh, atmospheric pressure in here. C, give an example of application of iodine in medicinal industry. You can, as you all, all know already, iodine can act as antiseptic. Eh? Or what are the, the these uh, isotopes of iodine 131 is used to treat pointer. So you can give either one answer inside here, as long as it is used in medicinal industries. So that is how you answer for question number three. So with an essential, let's go to question number four. Phase diagram of carbon dioxide is given below. So number one, dry ice is commonly used in concert to form fog. Explain the formation of fog. So as you already know, the formation of fog is not because of the carbon dioxide. The fog is due to the formation of the water vapor. Okay, so how does water vapor is actually formed? Water droplet, uh, to be more specific, water droplet. So how is actually water droplet is formed? So uh, in dry ice, uh, so dry ice when you release uh, Okay, it will undergo sublimation. It will undergo sublimation, where sublimation changes from solid to become vapor. So the process of solid becoming vapor is a sublimation process. And this sublimation process absorb heat from the surrounding. Okay, absorb heat from the surrounding. So when it's absorbing heat from the surrounding, at the end of the day, the surrounding feel cold. Okay, so when the surrounding feel cold, okay, so the water vapor around there condense because as you absorb the air around or you absorb the heat surrounding, so surrounding heat decrease, so the system will respond to increase back by absorbing the heat in here. So as a result, the air become cool. When the air become cool, the water vapor can no longer stay as the vapor. It will undergo condensation to become liquid. So that is why you see as a white box here. Okay, number two, carbon dioxide in the fire extinguisher is in liquid form. Indicate, indicates in the above phase diagram the changes in the physical state of carbon dioxide when the pressure is reduced. So when the pressure is reduced from the liquid, so it undergoes uh, condensation, uh, vaporization as in here. Okay, so that is how you solve for number two. And then number three, dry ice has the following structure under atmospheric pressure. Calculate the number of carbon dioxide particles per dry, unit cell of dry ice in here. So uh, as you can see, obviously this is a phase center cubic. So for a phase center cubic, uh, you have uh, each of the particles which occupy half phase of the uh, surface for this uh, cube. And then since you have six phases, so six times uh, one over two, okay, plus eight corner, eight times one over eight, so at the end of the day, the number of particles for uh, per unit cell is four particles per dry uh, dry ice in here. Okay, so that is how you solve number one, and then number two, name the solid structure of the dry ice. We said that is phase center cubic. So that is how you answer for question number B. Yeah? So immediately we go to the next question, which is question number five. The great 17th century English chemist Robert Boyles performed a series of experiments to relate the gas that leads him to come with a conclusion about one gas law. Number one, state the conclusion of the gas law deduced by Robert Boyles. Robert Boyles suggested that uh, volume of the gas is inversely proportional with the pressure, or you write it inversely, uh, reversely also can. Pressure is inversely proportional with volume, so can be accepted. Sh shouldn't be any much of a problem. Okay, then B, complete the graph below, which are related to the gas law deduced by Robert Boyle. So Robert Boyle deduced uh, pressure against volume. So what is the expected curve to be? So this is the expected of P against 1 over B. Okay. P against one over V. Yeah? If PV, it is a negative divided curve. Okay, but since it is P against one over V, so it is a straight line positive gradient. Yeah? Okay, then number two, PV against P. Yeah? PV is a constant because it is an ideal gas. So no matter how great uh, this uh, P changes its pressure, so they will have no effects towards the uh, boil constant. Yeah? 
Okay, so that is why it's supposed to be uh, static like this. Okay, so this is for number B. And then number C, contain A, B, and C uh, are filled with nitrogen, neon, and argon. Each are gases are attacked by a closed stopwatch, stop clock, and uh, shown in the diagram below. So this is the stop clock. Number one, by assuming that there are no reaction occur between the gases that are mixed, consider the uh, calculate the pressure, partial pressure of each container after the stop clock is removed and the container allowed to react. So you have, first of all, you have to recalculate what is the pressure after you disconnect the uh, valve in here. So uh, you use P1, V1 equals to P2, V2. So V2 uh, in here is the V total. So uh, N2 is here is uh, 500 times 20 equals to P2 times 20 plus 12 plus 7. You have a Pascal for neon nitrogen is 256 kilopascal. As for the neon is 350 times 12. P1, V1 equals to P2, V2 also. So P2 is 20 plus 12 plus 7. So P2 is 108 here. And then last but not least is argon. Argon is 200 times 7 goes to P2 times 20, 20 times 12, 12 plus 7. So therefore, recalculate back as I, what I've told you to your, uh, uh, told you just now. So uh, you should be able to calculate the pressure accordingly. So the pressure for nitrogen, neon, and argon are 256 kilopascal, 108 kilopascal, and 55.9 kilopascal respectively. Number two, calculate the total pressure of the container. So total pressure of the container is 256 plus 108 plus 35.9. You have a 400 kilopascal. Then number six, diagram below shows the unit cell of the copper. State the type of multiprepetitive unit cell in the copper. So this one is obviously a base center cubic. Then number B, calculate the number of copper atom in one uh, unit cell of copper. So in here, it is made of six faces and eight corner. So it's six times 12 plus eight times one over eight. So you have four copper atoms per unit cell. Given the length of the each unit is of copper is 0 0.1362 nanometer, calculate the volume of each unit cell and express in the meter cube in here. So uh, you, uh, you use the uh, volume is equals to uh, because it's cube, isn't it? So you use the volume is equals to height times length times y. So since they are the same, so 0 0.362 times 10 power negative 9 cube. So uh, you get 4.74 times 10 power negative 29 meter cube. Okay, two marks very straightforward. Huh? And number two, density of the copper is 8.93 times 10 power 6 gram per meter cube. Based on the answer in B and C1 to calculate the mass of each unit cell. So you use density is equals to mass over volume. So 8.93 times 10 power 6 multiplied by 4.79 times 10 power negative 29. Press your calculator. So um, you have a uh, 4. Uh, each unit cell contains four copper atoms. So mass of each unit cell is 4 times 4.24 times 10 power negative 22. So you get 1.69 times 10 power 21 gram. So that is how you should calculate uh, the, the mass of the coppers in here using density. Yeah? Okay, so with that, that is how you solve for question number six. Last but not least, question number seven. Fluorine diamond are allotrope of carbon. Define the terms allotropes. So allotropes are elements that have the same physical state but different molecular structure arrangement. Deduce the, uh, describe the structure of solid fluorine. So solid fluorine is a, a subspecies where each carbon is sp2 or sp3 hybridized. Then it is surrounded by either three or four other carbon atoms. Okay, so that is how you describe the structure of solid fluorine. C, fluorine subline. Uh, at about 800 Kelvin. Diamond also subline, but above 3,800 Kelvin. Explain why fullerene and diamond subline at different temperatures. So this has to do with the structure of fullerene. So diamond has a giant covalent structure, while fullerene is a simple covalent molecule. So uh, inside the diamond, each carbon is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms, therefore build a giant network that has a very high melting point. Whereas fullerene is a simple covalent molecule pulled by weak van der Waal forces. So that is why uh, it's sublime relatively at a lower temperature compared to diamond. Okay. So with that, that is how you are going to explain for the allotropy between fullerene and diamond. And that is all for the structure question that I have for you. So uh, I hope that this will help you to answer well. So uh, I see you in our next section, which is the essay section for chapter four. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.